the Satmar community presents itself as a continuation of a pre-war way of life, but it, um, it's actually very new. The ideology behind the community is new. Um, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors and they raised me and they joined the sect after the war and they lived, I would say, traditional Jewish lives before the war, but not a bit by any means extremists or, or fundamentalists. And um, it's hard to separate the, the misogyny from the religious patriarchy and from the trauma-based ideology. So it's all kind of connected. So there, this is a community founded by Holocaust survivors, led by a, a very charismatic leader who believed that the Holocaust was a punishment for assimilation, for political integration and emancipation. And um, he wanted to recreate the ghetto in America. And he wanted um, us to live a very new and extreme interpretation of Jewish law as a means of appeasing a god angry enough to cause the Holocaust. And women were very central in this strategy because he felt that it was important to replace all the lives that had been lost by bringing as many children into the world as possible. But this was also a political strategy because in this sense, the community can increase its numbers and therefore its political power because the community votes as a bloc. And especially, for example, in a country like Israel, um, the religious communities have increased demographically so much more quickly than the, the secular that we have seen in the last decades how, how deeply influenced um, the politics has become by, by religious ideology and by biblical law. And so in a sense, the goal of the, of the ultra-Orthodox in general, um, uh, where, where Satmar has also played a, um, a, a role, an influential role, is to, is to both replace what has been lost, but also to become the most powerful force in, in Jewish society. And um, to do that, women have to be absolutely controlled, and they have to be um, sort of like bringing children into this world from the moment that they're fertile until, until the very, you know, the end of, of, of their fertile years um, as frequently as possible. And they also have to do the work, not only in, in raising the children and managing the household, but in general, they have to perform the labor that is required to maintain human existence so that the men are free to perform spiritual work. And it's presented as a deal um, in, in the sense that if women do the labor, they will get 50% of the reward in heaven, mm. right? This is the contract. And so the men go to synagogue and study and the women work and manage the household and raise the children. But they have actually no say in, in the forming of their children's minds and hearts. They are there to care for the children physically. And you, what you said to me, uh, what you said to the audience right now, um, where you said the marriage age was reduced to nine, um, you know, in, in my community, we marry quite young, not, not nearly as young, but we marry young. And I've always felt that one of the reasons why women are married off young, where I come from, is that it's so important to, for them not to have a chance to, to question, to doubt, to think about what else they might want. It's so important to entrap them completely into, in, in their lives, especially with children. I mean, there is, there is no greater trap, in a sense, for women than having children because um, they become the priority. And if you cannot, if you cannot guarantee their safety and their well-being, um, nothing, nothing else is, is worth it. And so, children become the leverage with which the community controls women once they, once they're married off um, and, and reach adulthood. But even until then, um, they, they are, are so tightly controlled not because the religion necessarily demands it. I don't think any of the laws I grew up with were, were in any way entrenched in any kind of religious text. I mean, there was like, there were all these like very extraneous details, mm -hmm. like stockings, for example. Mm -hmm. The rabbi was sort of famous for testing the stockings on his own arm to see if they were thick enough. Um, there was a lot of attention paid to details, um, which I think is a great, it's a great method of distraction. Like I think if you're obsessed with the thickness of tights or the length of skirts, um, you can kind of uh, uh, 
distract from from bigger ideas like what is threatening about a, a woman's body, um, you know. And, and if the tights were not thick enough, what would happen? They were made thicker. So in my childhood, the, the tights became thicker over time. Um, tight thickness is measured in den yards. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the, the den yards just kept going up. Um, and the same thing happened with skirt lengths. Like when, 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 I, when I found this photo of my aunts when they were little, I noticed that their skirts were like just above the knee and I freaked out and I ran into the kitchen. I was like, oh my God, I found a photo of our aunts with like immodest skirts. And she looked at it and she was like, oh no, back then it was allowed. Because when I was going to school, it had to be, it had to be 10 centimeters below the knee. Mm -hmm. And it was like such a clear line and I felt it was so immovable, 10 centimeters, you know, mm -hmm. that is the law. But it wasn't the law. It was arbitrary. It could change all the time. It had no basis in anything. Um, and so I, I feel like my, my adolescence was suffused with a lot of random, almost meaningless obsessions with measurements and <laughs> thicknesses um, because we were kept so busy <laughs> with policing ourselves. We never really thought why we were policing ourselves. And you say policing ourselves? Um, but were you already also policing others and were others policing you? And was it men? Was it women? Was it all? Oh, no, we definitely all policed each other. Um, it, one of the reasons I never had friends when I was growing up is it was too dangerous <laughs> because um, no friendship was, was holy enough to prevent that from that attitude from being reproduced. Um, so there just was it was there was no possibility of trusting somebody else. It was either have friends and risk being outed when you did something wrong, mm -hmm. or or just you know completely withdraw. And so it's, it's of course it makes sense now in retrospect. And, um, women shouldn't be friends with each other, right? <laughs> because it's dangerous. Yes. yes. <laughs> so we we weren't really allowed to have any relationships. Mariam, how, how do you listen to this? I see you nodding a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, um, um, I, think, I think even if you come from different religious backgrounds, um, there are so many similarities, isn't it? Because I think, uh, for, well, personally, I feel all religions are patriarchal. All religions are obsessed with women's bodies. Uh, and that whole... Uh, idea of spending all this time measuring and making sure that it fits in with what is permissible um, is something that occupies a lot of women uh, a lot of the time um, and until they begin to break free and resist. And it, it is interesting because um, when you look at all religious texts, um, there is this idea that women are a deviant form of men they are a baser form of men, they are weak, they are um, dangerous. And if you look at texts, for example, in Islam, uh, Muhammad says, uh, it, Islam's prophet um, says that, uh, uh, you know, in hell, it's mainly women who are there. Uh, so it's a great place to be. I mean, I'd like to go there if, if there is one. <laughs> Um, you know, you have, uh, in, in the Jewish tradition, there's this prayer uh, where men thank God that they were not born women. In Christianity, uh, women are seen to be uh, the gateway to the devil. Uh, you know, in the Hindu religion, women, uh, there's the Manu laws, which are famous uh, Indian uh, uh, scripts, uh, where women are uh, seen to be, uh, all of them are seen to be prostitutes. And in Buddhist um, text as well, it's, it's about how women prevent men from reaching spirituality, the highest form of spirituality. So in all religions, you see how perfectly useful it is for patriarchy. It's the best form of patriarchy because it's not just your father or your husband or the state telling you, but God himself is telling you, so you better pay attention. You know, because um, it, it's so dangerous to to transgress those rules. So, I think when when you see that, you do see um, the solidarity amongst those who have gone through it and who've come out the other side, uh, possibly very broken, uh, tra traumatized. Uh, I mean, I see that a lot amongst ex-Muslims. What is and what is so traumatizing about it? Well, it. There's a lot of control and fear. You know, Deborah mentioned this idea of policing yourself all the time. You know how 
tire, tire, tiring that is, constantly policing yourself, making sure you're dressed appropriately, having everyone telling you um, that you're not um, towing the line. There's a lot of pressure, uh, constant pressure. And the thing is that there's a lot of things that can be made invisible in society. What you think can be invisible to some extent, unless you speak out, you know, even maybe being gay, you can possibly hide it. You can hardly hide being a woman, you know, and, uh, and, they, and because women are the first target of religion and the religious right, they make a point of making sure that you're controlled and that you're managed. Uh, it's, it's their way of asserting their power. It's their way of uh, showing that they are in charge because if they are in charge of the women they are in charge you know and so I think that's why it's such I think so inspiring so moving so human to see the great women's liberation movements in countries under Islamic rule from Iran to the women in Afghanistan standing up to the Taliban uh, to Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, women fighting against the Sharia code in, in the family law. So, you know, it's, I think women's liberation comes particularly in the fight against religion. And if there are any gains, it is because there has been that challenge to religion, because there has been that challenge to dogma, and um, because there has been a deep criticism of religion. I know in a lot of situations uh, we're labeled Islamophobic or we're, we're told that we're you know, going too far, we don't respect religion. Well, I won't respect an idea that considers me half a human being. I will not respect an idea that considers uh, women to be um, you know, prostitutes and uh, to, uh, who are there to, uh, who are inferior and who are debased you know, and, and in that sense, it is a great disrespect to women to expect us to have any respect for religion and religious laws.